You are listening to Radio Free Humanity, the Marxist Humanist Podcast. My name is Brendan Cooney. And I'm Andrew Kleiman. In this episode, we discuss the relevance of the crisis theory of Henrik Grossman with author Ted Reese. His recent book is The End of Capitalism, The Thought of Henrik Grossman. To hear more episodes of Radio Free Humanity, to read more about the issues discussed, or to join in the conversation, please visit MarxistHumanistInitiative.org. You can also make a donation to the podcast there on the website. While our podcast is hosted by MHI, the views expressed by the co-hosts and guests of Radio Free Humanity are their own. They do not necessarily reflect the views and positions of MHI. In just a few minutes, we'll be talking about Henrik Grossman with Ted Reese. But first, as we do in every episode, Andrew and I will take a few minutes to talk about some current events. Well, we are recording this current event section on May 24th of 2022. And we're going to be talking about the primary election season in the U.S., particularly the state primaries that were held in Pennsylvania a week ago on May 17th. Uh, I happen to live in Pennsylvania, so I have a little bit of a close-up view on what's going on in PA and how that affects national politics and the ongoing battle to stop fascists from taking over the U.S. So that's what we're going to be mostly focusing on on this current event section. First of all, there's 50 states in the United States, but Pennsylvania is a large state. Pennsylvania is not part of the Deep South or any part of the South. So when you get Trumpism reaction taking hold in a place like Pennsylvania, it's a big thing. Uh, Right now, it's considered a a swing state. So there were a number of primary contests, you know, for uh, governor, for Senate, on both the the Democratic and the Republican side. What has a lot of people worried, you were alluding to that, Brendan, uh, a moment ago, is the Republican nominee for governor. What is the worry? What is the problem with this, this guy, Doug Mastriano? The wider context, first is just that everyone running for governor on the Republican ticket was a nut job, was like a far-right Republican, and they were all vying to be the Trumpiest of the Trumpites. They all wanted Trump's endorsement. Doug Mastriano got Trump's endorsement at the very last minute, probably because he was ahead in the polls, right? Trump just wants to win. But he, I think he got ahead in the polls by being the Trumpiest of, of the lot. He was, he's the real deal. No, I think he's more Trumpy than Trump. You know, I think Trump was in many ways an imperfect vehicle for the emerging Christian fascist coalition in American politics. And Trump could have even been a worse president if he hadn't been, you know, senile and unorganized and unintelligent and all the other problems that sort of made him ineffective at doing all the bad things that he wanted to do. Doug Mastriano is a far right Christian fascist. He is plan, if he becomes governor, is to do everything he can to assure that Democrats could never win the state of Pennsylvania again. If he wins the governor's race in PA, it's kind of like all over for the Democrats because their plan is to pass laws such that the governor can decide to throw out any votes that they think are fraudulent based on whatever evidence they want to uh, bring up. And he also thinks that the governor uh, and the the state legislature should be able to select their own board of electors in a presidential election over the will of the voters. You know, Doug Mastriano organized buses and did fundraising to bring people to the January 6th riot, or Capitol insurrection, as it should be called. He's a wildly conservative Christian. He believes uh, life starts at conception. He wants to pass a fetal heart rate bill, you know, which, which bans abortion as soon as a heart rate's detected. But he thinks, says that even that's too moderate. He'd rather just abandon abortions as soon as conception happens. He's he's wildly homophobic and anti-trans. And his candidacy really represents like this perfect merging of the fascist right with evangelical Christianity. You know, he believes he's on a mission from God to become the governor and bring Trump back to office in 2024. Um, He's kind of like everyone's worst nightmare. He won the the Republican nomination for a governor by a landslide. He completely crushed his opponents. And it wasn't even an issue of like the ticket being split between like more moderate candidates or something because he got more than the second and third place candidates put together. So he, he won by a huge margin. Right. And, and they weren't moderate either, as you said. <laughs> right. They were all competing to be the Trumpiest. He just sold the message 
way better. You know, he's QAnon adjacent. He's a big lie person. He went to the Capitol insurrection. He blows a shofar at his rallies. He's he's every nightmare that a Republican Trumpy person could be, like times 100. Yeah, he has a number of uh, master's degrees, and in one of the military academies that he's got a a degree from, I I haven't read it, but uh, I I read a news story on it. It was... uh, Yeah, the Washington Post did a story on it right after he... They always wait until after these people get nominated to, like, start vetting them. Yeah. He wrote a master's thesis, which was essentially a novel, and it sounded just like the Turner Diaries, which is a neo-Nazi love story about taking over the United States and, and killing all the liberals and the, b- the black people. It's amazing that the military let that be uh, accepted as a as a thesis. I know. I know. It just sounds like a deranged sci-fi novel about some military general who's hiding in a cave because the country has been overrun with woke liberals and he uses like a military coup to take back power and it's supposed to be like he's defending the, the civilian use of the military power to establish order and it's like a, a you know a blatantly kind of fascistic theory of like how to blur the lines between military and and the government yeah he's he's really nuts right he's nuts but as you said he's not a fringe candidate i mean the the, the republican base and in the great commonwealth of pennsylvania which is it's not the deep south they're all in behind this big lie stuff and 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 all the rest of it i mean i assume they're not all christian nationalists there's other things going on and it seems to be that the uh the point of unity is fascism now his opponent in the general election the democrat is josh shapiro and shapiro is an elections official and he's evidently making the integrity of elections the right to vote uh, uh, a big deal he, he also started running ads around abortion this week yeah i was going to ask you about uh, okay but w- one thing he did was to try to promote how extreme you know before the primary vote shapiro was running ads about how extreme mastriano was and that was evidently some people thought an attempt to get mastriano to be his opponent so you could have a straight up vote on the time of the general election on you know are we going to have a state that is in favor of voting rights or not uh, I mean, the the problem is the Hillary Clinton, Clinton campaign kind of did things to encourage the outcome that her opponent would be not some regular Republican, but Donald Trump, right? And that worked out real well. So Cook Political Report basically had the Pennsylvania governor race as a toss-up prior to Mastriano getting the nomination. Then once he got it, they immediately said, okay, now it leans Democratic. And a lot of people are thinking, well, this guy is so extreme that some Republican suburban people who are not MAGA, they're going to break, and so it's going to favor the Democrat Shapiro. What's what's your view of this? I think it's a very dangerous game of be careful what you wish for. I, I mean, I think you're right that Josh Sapiro, who was running unopposed as the for, in, in a Democratic nomination for governor, apparently sent out you know mailers and did TV ads linking Mastriano to Trump, thinking this will help him win the primary, but he'll he'll be the weakest candidate in the election because he's so nuts. I, I mean, I suppose there is a logic to that, but it's a extremely dangerous logic, as you are alluding to, because um, I don't think there's any guarantee that this will be a walk in the park for Josh Sapiro, just considering the headwinds that are against Democrats right now with inflation, pandemic fatigue, uh, Joe Biden's miserable uh, poll numbers. There's also this Senate race in Pennsylvania, which we still don't know the outcome of on the Republican side. Ironically, it's going to a recount and um, all, all the votes matter now, apparently, for the Re- Republicans, for their Senate candidates. But the, the Democratic Senate nomination, John Fetterman, is, I think, a, a, a weak candidate in many ways. And I worry that's going to suppress, you know, all these things are going to suppress Democratic voter turnout, various reasons. Now, Fetterman is very popular uh, among the Democratic base. I mean, he, he took the, the nomination two to one or better than two to one. He won everywhere in the state. So why, why do you say he's a weak candidate? He almost lost Philadelphia to Malcolm Kenyatta, who is a gay black man from North Philly. Kenyatta didn't do well on the, the statewide, but he, Kenyatta almost won Philadelphia over Fetterman. Fetterman didn't 
campaign in Philadelphia the entire primary. He didn't come to Philadelphia the entire time. I, I think that's crazy. Like, how do you expect to win an election in Pennsylvania without campaigning in the largest city with the most Democratic voters? Fetterman also had an incident when he was he was was mayor like 15 years ago or so of a small town in Western PA, and he had an incident where he, as mayor, chased down a black jogger in his pickup truck and put a shotgun to the jogger's chest and held him at gunpoint because he thought that he'd heard gunshots in the neighborhood and he saw a black man running on the street. Fetterman is white. And he chased this guy down in the pickup truck and, and, and held him up with a shotgun until the police arrived. And turns out the guy was just a jogger. And and Fetterman doubled down on doing this. He defended himself when he was asked about this early in the campaign. He said, oh, well, it was just after Sandy Hook and everyone was worried about school shootings and blah, 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 blah. I just think it's a very bad look. The kind of thing that sticks in your, in your mind as a voter. And I, I think it's going to be bad for his voter turnout in Philadelphia which is a, a, I always get it wrong, majority-minority city, minority-majority city, whatever, however, whatever the expression is. Right, so in your mind, the two things are linked. Uh, Fetterman's weak uh, performance in, in Philly is not just about Malcolm Kenyatta running a strong race in, in Philly, but it's also connected to this incident in Braddock. I haven't seen, like, polling about that specific incident and people's impression of Fetterman, but... I worry that it's the kind of thing that's going to come back to bite him. If I was Dr. Oz running for Senate and I was running a disinformation campaign and trying to discourage black voters, I would just run ads about that all day long in black communities. Yep, sounds right. Uh, (laughs) And if Putin didn't have his uh, hands full with Ukraine, he'd be doing the same thing. Um, Yeah, I mean, that's what we had during the 2020 elections. Trump was running all these ads in black communities with all this disinformation. I heard them on the radio all the time. They were just trying to discourage black people from coming out to vote. And a lot of the ads were about the 1994 crime bill that Joe Biden voted for. And all you have to do is peel off a certain amount of people to win the election. Look, Trump lost Pennsylvania by like 80,000 votes. That's not that much. Right. There were like 7 million votes or more than yeah. 7 million votes. So, so 80,000 is nothing. Yeah, yeah, it's a real swing state. It's a real toss up. And every vote really matters. Yeah, and this is an off-year election. I mean, there's no presidential election this year, 2022. Traditionally, that's a real problem for the Democrats. I, I, I've even heard it said that the future of U.S. democracy hangs in the balance in Pennsylvania right now. Oh, man, that's what they said two years ago. <laughs> I don't want to be at the eye of the hurricane again. God. Where do we go from here knowing that they've said the quiet part out loud? In fact, they're screaming it. We know how they're intending to steal the election if they get half a chance. Where do we go from here? I don't know. It just seems like the problem is not going to go away. Even if we won this governor election, the big lie is going to still be there. The competition to be more Trumpier than the next guy is going to still be there. These people don't want to live in a democratic society and they will stop at nothing to destroy democracy. So I'm not sure what you're supposed to do, it's hard to like respond to that with just politics as usual. You can't persuade people and you can't just rely on voter turnout when elections are so close in a state like this. So I don't really know what to do. Even if there's a massive Democratic turnout and they, they win by, by six points or something, 2024, if you got this Republican governor, Mastriano, and you got this hard right Supreme Court, the uh, Thomas and Ginny Thomas and Alito and all the rest of them, they can nullify the, the, the will of the voters. And so what I'm concerned with is what do we do then? Do we just sit down and take it? We need to be prepared and th- thinking about what to do then because they've told us that this is their plan. How do we respond to that? It cannot be any more a matter of, okay, just get out the vote. One can say, well, they'll be shy about doing that if it's a massive landslide. But, you know, even if it were a massive landslide, these people are nuts and they stop at nothing. And the only thing that stops them is that they're stopped. To, to me, it's obvious that, that we need to be prepared for what, what to do when the Supreme Court lets the election be rigged. We know that they already did this under much different circumstances. In the year 2000, when uh, George W. Bush became president by a five to four vote uh, of the Supreme Court. So we've got to um, understand that that's, that's what we're up against, I think. It's, it's not a matter of winning an election. It's a matter of 
thwarting the post-election shenanigans and the Supreme Court's ratification. Well, we will have to leave it at that. I'm sure we will return to this topic in future conversations. Up next, our interview with Ted Reese about the thought of Henrik Grossman. Today is May 20th of 2022, and we are pleased to have on the podcast Ted Reese to discuss his new book about Henrik Grossman. Ted Reese is a British Marxist writer and theorist. His first two books were self-published. The first one, Socialism or Extinction in 2019 and Humanizing Production in 2021. His third book, The End of Capitalism, The Thought of Henrik Grossman, is out with zero books from the 27th of May. Drawing on Grossman, among other Marxists, he argues that capitalism is approaching a final breakdown, compelling the struggle for global socialism, which is becoming an economic necessity for the first time as a result of the evolution of capitalism's economic technical basis, i.e. the rise of an increasingly integrated and automated system of production. Regular listeners will know that we have discussed Grossman's work before, and listeners should also know that shortly, Andrew Kleiman, of course, my co-host, will be publishing a review of Ted Reese's book on With Sober Senses. And without further ado, let's just jump into discussing the book and Grossman and all these things. So, Ted, welcome to the podcast. Hi, thanks very much for having me on. I, re- I really appreciate getting the chance to speak to you and a chance to defend Grossman. I- I- I'm sure I won't be able to change your minds completely in a 90-minute talk, but I'll give it-, give it a go. Yes, hi, Ted. Thanks for coming on. Thanks, Andrew. We are always grateful when people are willing to discuss things. Discussion moves things forward, so... All right. Well, Ted, how long have you been interested in Grossman? And what is it about Grossman that makes you interested in Grossman? About eight years ago now, I started writing economic theory with a focus on automation. I was reading a lot about automation and how fast it was advancing and you know how it was displacing workers and so on and so forth. I started writing sort of a paper or an essay on the subject and I got a comrade to read it and he recommended that I read Grossman's Law of Accumulation and try to apply some of what was in that because obviously I was saying to him, you know, the more automated production gets, the more possibility of commodity producing labour being abolished becomes a reality. And he said, well, if you want to argue about, you know, final breakdowns, you need to read Grossman. So I read Grossman's book. Obviously, it was just the abridged version that was published in 1992. And I just found it very clarifying with regard to Marx's arguments once I had read that and applied it to the essay I wrote, which then ended up turning into my first book, which was called Socialism or Extinction, it just went from there and I I wanted to read more Grossman. Just a clarifying question. You said that you were first interested, you were discussing the effect of automation on what was it? The end of commodity production or? The automation of commodity production so that the human part of the commodity production process is becoming smaller, relatively speaking. Okay. All right. Well, let's get into some stuff about your book. So your new book discusses uh, lots of different Grossman related things. One chapter is on the law of accumulation and breakdown of the capitalist system, the book in which Grossman set out his breakdown theory. And elsewhere, you discuss other works of his, his political orientation, political activity, other aspects of his life. Is there a primary focus of the book, one like main argument that you're trying to get across? Yeah, so the main argument that I'm trying to make in the book is that Grossman is becoming increasingly relevant again, and more so than ever, given the, what I would consider to be a, a very late stage of capitalism and its development that we're in now, and the ever-worsening series of economic crises that we've experienced since the turn of the century. So the book argues that Grossman was the first Marxist after Marx to correctly explain the structure of capital, that he was right about capitalism's inherent tendency towards breakdown, that he offers a powerful reinforcement and clarification of Marx that helps us to better defend Marx and to persuade people to become Marxists. Because Grossman is not well known outside of a very small circle of Marxist theorists, even if he's starting to get a bit more popular again, I included like a short biographical summary, which sort of included some of his political views and how they complemented or tallied with his theories. And just to clarify, when you say late stage capitalism, you don't mean like the latest stage of capitalism, but you mean 
like some final terminal stage of capitalism that you think we're in, right? Yeah, I, I kind of mean both. I think capitalism will end this century one way or another. And that's obviously based not on wishful thinking or anything like that. It's based on applying the theory to the empirical evidence, which we'll get into. Okay, so capitalism is in a terminal stage. You're confident enough that you can sort of predict its demise as a mode of production in this century. And you think there's empirical evidence to support the idea that this were in a terminal stage. Is it, again, linked to automation, as you spoke of earlier in your first answer? Yeah, I would argue that capitalism has really undergone a decisive structural shift in in regards to automation originally in the leading cap or the most advanced capitalist uh, countries initially automation was mainly used you know not not for production as such it was used for other things uh, like a, to, to do away with administrative tasks and sort that sort of thing but because of the rising demands of capital accumulation and therefore the need to raise the rate of labor's productivity coupled with the competition that is intensifying because of that the most advanced capitalist monopolies have had to start accelerating moves towards automating commodity production uh, marx actually says that the tendency to expand accumulation tends to happen increasingly on the basis of the latest technology as well. So that's why I talk about decisive um, structural shift in that way. So in the structural shift, like starting when? like I think it's already happened that we, we've started going through that process. I, I would call it a second industrial revolution. No, that's what I wanted to ask. You, you're not saying like since the first industrial revolution, you're talking about like more recently, like with robotics and computerization? Yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah. That's I, the I shift. would say you're... I would call the digital revolution part of the automation revolution or the second industrial revolution. And so the, the automation connected to this period we're in now involving computerization, robots, digital technology, that is sort of the the hallmark of this late stage capitalism. Yeah. Okay, great. So one of your major claims, Ted, in support of Grossman's breakdown theory is that the rate of profit must inevitably fall, and not only fall, but fall toward zero, approach zero over time. Why do you say that? Now we can get into the empirical evidence, which is m the main reason why I say that, because I think it's very clear now. So I know you dis probably disagree with some of the studies showing that the general rate of profit or world rate of profit has tended to fall over time. There's the Esteban uh, Mato study, which estimates or claims to estimate that the decade average of the rate of profit has fallen from 43% in the 1870s to 17% in the 2010s. Michael Roberts and others have done probably not as comprehensive studies, but others that indicate similar conclusions. You, Andrew, in your 2011 book, that the rate of profit, did, uh, did you say it fell, or that it just stagnated since World War II to around 2010? Uh, it fell from the start of the post-war period in the United States. Rate of profit of U.S. corporations uh, fell from the beginning of the post-war period to approximately 1980, dawn of so-called neoliberalism, and then it basically stagnated, or, or, or fell depending on the measure. That's not a historical measure, but it's still quite a long period of time. I think these conclusions are backed up by other historical data that we can now look at. There's one very recent, uh, very comprehensive study from the Bank of England showing that interest rates have trended secularly downwards towards zero over the last seven centuries. And interest is, of course, a form of profit. Um, GDP growth has trended downwards over the last 50 years or tended to. Obviously, that's not a direct proxy for the rate of profit but it, it's an indication and then there's the energy return on investment on fossil fuel has fallen from 101 in 1930 to about six to one or by some estimates three to one in 2019 and i think that gives us further corroboration again it's not a direct proxy but it shows that it's becoming increasingly unprofitable in relative terms to invest in fossil fuel and according to sid smith this is happening with all energy production he's got a lecture that you can watch on youtube if you haven't seen it called how to enjoy the end of the world i disagree with some of his conclusions but it's hard to argue against his argument that uh, energy return on investment is falling towards very closely towards zero now 
does this prove that it inevitably falls towards zero and maybe you can't say for sure but i feel like uh, after the fact I, I would say that it does we're too close to zero on too many fronts to to be able to deny this um so f- it seems very strongly that the real world has proven to be consistent with marx's theory and as a general rule as capital accumulates the rate of profit falls the rate of profit falls when the mass of profit falls relative to the mass of capital value and marx does say one of his quotes on it is that the law of a progressive fall in the rate of profit is also a relative decline in the surplus value appropriated so with the rise of automation there's less labor to um, appropriate surplus value from in in relative terms Um, and because just lastly because capitalism is a dynamic not a static system the fall in the rate of profit has to be offset by accumulating a greater mass of profit and capital only to intensify that contradiction just a couple of clarifying questions Um, when you say that the rate of profit historically is falling over time Obviously, we all know that capitalism goes through these cycles of boom and bust, depressions, etc. You're not talking about those, right? Because those don't just go in one direction, those go up and down. You're talking about some longer trend. So like, what is the claim? Is it that like the peaks are getting lower or the, like an average of the peaks and valleys are getting lower? You know, like, what exactly is the claim? The, the troughs are getting lower. And when does they, when do they start to get lower? Um, well, in the the study that Esteban Mato did, they they don't always get lower as time goes on, but they tend to. Like maybe 15 years after the the previous trough, that that trough will be a bit higher, but the one after that will be lower than the the one before that sort of thing. Does that make any sense? I think so. I'm sure the rate of profit goes up and down in cycles, but the the dominant tendency on average is that it it falls. It falls falls between the, the the peaks and troughs that there's a tendency down if you were to average it out from the start of capitalism to where we are now it would show a line that is moving downward that's my argument and that that's the same with that study on interest rates it shows that sort of averaging out i know this is sort of parenthetical but i just want to be clear from my own understanding you said the energy return on investment and does that mean the amount of energy like wattages or volts or however you measure energy that you get per like dollar spent on fossil fuel or per like gallon of gas like what because i would think that technology is becoming more efficient with the way it uses energy over time right yeah so, exactly. i mean i've never heard that claim so i don't know what the empirical basis is but i would think that because technology is getting more efficient that when you invest in, te- in a technology to consume fossil fuels, you're getting more energy out of it. But you're saying the opposite has happened? You're getting less energy? Yeah, the question is the return. how are you measuring the return in dollar terms or in physical terms? Yeah, so in, abs- in absolute terms, we're getting more energy per dollar, but in relative terms... We're not. It's the opposite. But so, by relative, you mean like like the the dollar value or the, the monetary value? The, let me clarify. The absolute output is in in energy production is increasing, but not for every for every dollar that is invested, the amount of energy uh, being produced is falling. So that's that's declining productivity. Okay, that's the opposite of what Brendan is saying we should expect it's declining productivity relative to each dollar invested but in absolute terms it's growing but it's coming up against an absolute limit because of the va- because it's tied to value if it wasn't tied to value then we wouldn't have to worry about a crash in energy production right but uh, it, so if you're saying it's tied to value that can only be because of two things one you're not measuring the actual output of energy in physical terms you're measuring the value of the energy that's produced or or maybe both you're not measuring the actual physical investment but the monetary amount of, of investment it still seems very counterintuitive i won't be able to clear it up because i'm not a, yeah. an expert on the subject i would recommend watching sid smith's lecture on youtube it's called how to enjoy the end of the world he comes to the conclusion that we are heading for a return to per- permanent scarcity there's lo- there's a lot of studies you can look up and read o- online well i'll have to check it out because i'm not familiar with the claim it's very counterintuitive to me but i might be misunderstanding like andrew said uh, yeah i would like to follow up on, on on this question first i mean yeah mark said that the the rate of profit you know will fall 
but what he didn't say, and what I think is in fact unique to you, Ted, I, I don't even know that it's in Grossman, is that the fall in the rate of profit will continue until the rate of profit hits zero. And if it doesn't hit zero, it's just going to continue to trend downward further and further towards zero. I mean, this is not something that any empirical data can tell you because we, we can discuss Maito's study and, and, and the other things. But the idea that something has to happen inevitably in the future, past events aren't going to tell us definitive answer as to what's going to happen in the future. So what really interests me is your theoretical claim that there's something inherent in the laws of capitalist production that are driving the rate of profit toward zero. I, I just don't see that at all. Here's the, the, the core, in the most intuitive way I can express it, the core problem I have with this idea that the uh, rate of profit inevitably trends downward toward zero. First of all, new capital, constant capital plus variable capital, new you know investment in production. New capital is capitalized surplus value. Uh, Marx talks about this in part seven of volume one of Capital. You got the, the profit or the surplus value gets divided between capital, which is accumulated, and the part that they take for themselves, you know, revenue. So it's a portion of the surplus value or profit that's just been created. Okay, that's where the new capital comes from. So how can capital permanently grow faster than the profit if the profit is the source of the increase in the capital. The growth of capital is limited by the growth of profit, isn't it? I wouldn't say that I'm saying that capital permanently grows faster than surplus value, but that, that it tends to, that that becomes the dominant problem of a capital accumulation. And the reason it's not permanent is because the partial economic breakdowns that arise restore that equilibrium between capital value and surplus value and so the reason it gets faster is the the outlay on constant capital which is the value of the means of production tends to rise faster than the outlay on variable capital which is wages so constant capital tends to rise compared to variable capital and we can see from a lot of company accounts that this tendency does exist like the amount of capital value produced is much higher than the number of workers employed i know that's a slightly different thing but it those two things do tend to separate away from each other if you like um without a rise in the amount of value produced there is less value than before less profit profit than before and capitalists invest in private production primarily to make a profit i.e to increase the amount that they invested so there must come a point when they need to reverse any fall from devaluation. The productivity of labour, the number of commodities labour produces per labour hour, therefore has to rise to reverse the fall in the value of constant capital. But with, the, with every cycle in which the value of constant capital grows quicker than variable capital, the part of capital that produces new value we get closer to a point where there is not enough surplus value to cover the additional constant capital, the additional variable capital, and the part allocated for the consumption fund of the capitalists, which is the incentive for being a capitalist. So there's too much capital value relative to the value that can be reinvested profitably. And there's also more variable capital that can be employed. Essentially, the amount of labour and labour time that can be exploited at the present rate of accumulation is maximised. I would say that if Marx's labour theory of value is correct, then crisis theory must be primarily located in the production of value. So there's, there's an underproduction of surplus value, an overaccumulation of capital, and that's why in the real world we see an ever greater amount of hoarding and speculation. To offset the problem, capital is compelled to find ways to increase the amount of labour and labour time exploited. Yet at the same time, that is achieved through technical innovation and expansion that means the massive productive commodity producing labour dwindles relative to the size of the means of production. An increasing share of invested capital has to be dedicated to capital accumulation. Variable capital tends to fall relative to constant capital as a result. 
So just to clarify, it's not a permanent tendency per se, but it is ultimately the dominant one. And as Marx says, capital itself becomes the barrier to accumulation and tends to do so on a continually greater to a gr- continually greater extent. Ted said that as the mechanization, automation, all of this proceeds, uh, more and more of the surplus value or profit is accumulated, a greater share. Okay, that, so that's part, of, that's part of his answer. But this you know, increase in accumulated capital as a share of the total profit, the capitalization of surplus value, it, it has a limit. You can't invest, accumulate more than all of the profit. So eventually, if you're reaching 100% or 100% minus the minimum that the capitalists will take for their own consumption, etc. Okay, and so eventually, all of the the profit gets accumulated, or you know, all except some minimum, and then you cannot increase accumulation faster than profit anymore once you've hit that point. That's that's the way it seems to me. That yeah, that's that's the argument. That's when you get a breakdown, at least in Grossman's model, which I. I defend. Actually, in Grossman's model, you get a breakdown when the new capital exceeds the profit. And I'm, what I'm saying is it's, it can't ex- exceed the profit. You know, if you want to be totally crazy, extreme, you could imagine that all of the profit gets accumulated. Okay, but you're never going to get more than 100% of the profit being accumulated. That's just not even logically possible. I, I mean, in a single country, you could imagine borrowing or something from another country, but in the capitalist system as a whole, if, if profit is the source of the new investment, you can't invest more than the total profit. Okay, so you can't get this breakdown where the, the amount of profit is not sufficient to, to fund the investment that you're making. I, I mean, I would argue that what you're saying is, is what Grossman's saying. <laughs> <laughs> it's just another way of, of saying it. it. You said there there's a limit. You can't do that. There's a limit. And that, that's why you get the breakdown. You say in your paper on Grossman that there's not an- enough supply to meet demand. That's is that that's correct, isn't it? That's the implications of the Bauer-Grossman model with the constant uh, prices, yeah. It, I would say that what there is is a portion of capital capital value that can't find new investment because it would be unprofitable to do it so then you have to have a breakdown to cheapen production um, expansion and mergers which then enables the capitalist to find profitable investment well actually that's kind of the opposite because that means that there's more profit than investment rather than more investment than profit but here's why what I'm saying differs from, from, from Grossman, because yes, there is an absolute limit, and I, you know, I don't know, I don't think they're going to necessarily reach that limit. But in any case, the absolute maximum limit is 100%. Something can move closer and closer to that limit without a breakdown. Let's imagine that the capitalists were investing all of their profit, so they would invest all of their profit. So in that case, what we would have is. The accumulation, expansion of capital would increase in absolute amount just as much as the profit. Okay, And ultimately what that would mean is that capital would grow at the same rate that profit or surplus value grows. And the rate of profit is the profit or surplus value relative to the capital. And if they're both growing at the same rate, that means that the rate of profit is constant. It's not falling any, any longer. The process that I'm talking about does lead to a limit. It doesn't lead to indefinite onward and upward uh, accumulation, but it, there, there's no issue of, of a breakdown whereby the previous path has to go into re- reverse. It's just what you eventually get is, in the absolute uh, most extreme case, all of the profit going into accumulation, and eventually the constant capital is not growing faster than the, the, the profit because its source of expansion is the profit. So all of these breakdown scenarios just aren't going to come to pass. I think the problem is that like the ultimate limit is the, the amount of labour you're exploiting and how much of its labour time you're exploiting. So that has to change. And obviously, labour productivity rises. 
use v- values do devalue, but the constant capital will will devalue not continuously. It will devalue subsequent to a uh, form of production that's been adopted. So that that has to be taken into account. But I, I'm sure even in your book you mentioned that you can't exploit labour for more than 24 hours, and obviously that's again an extreme limit and people can't work around the clock but the breakdown or the crisis compels the capitalists to expand the amount of labor and the amount of labor time that they're exploiting in absolute terms that's where the thrust for the expansion of the system comes from so that's that's what makes it a dynamic rather than than a static system that that doesn't just reproduce itself on the same level but aren't you assuming what you need to prove you, you need to prove a breakdown and then you're just assuming a breakdown there i don't know I, I agree you have to prove it and i and i can't disprove your your paper and your spreadsheets i haven't had time to look at them in enough detail and work on something out i will try to and if i if i fail then i'll put my hands up and um revoke grossman Wow, that's really saying something. Well, it's only fair, isn't it? <laughs> well, it's 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 scientifically appropriate, but I'll tell you, people aren't like this. Um, no one ever says that. <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, I'm going to call you a Grossmanite because that's what you call yourself. I think that's what you, yeah. that's what you, yeah. you call yourself. Okay, so it's not a slur. But Marxist Humanist Initiative has like tried to arrange meetings with you know all of the, the Grossmanites out there and failed again and again and again and again. Uh, except for you. So as my people ask, why is this Grossmanite different from all other Grossmanites? I, I have to hand it to you, you know, for your, your scientific integrity and, and, and so forth and, and willingness to talk about these issues because it's just so different from what we have experienced from others. Yeah, well, obviously, that's a shame. That's a great shame. And I agree. I think these conversations, even when we disagree, are really important because without them, we don't get closer to establishing the truth or the science or whatever you want to call it. And that's that's what needs to happen. I mean, I listened to your podcast between the two of you on your paper and you said about Grossmanites being fatalists or, or tending to be fatalists or quietists. I mean, obviously, I'm not being a quietist because I'm what I'm actually trying to do with my work is to warn people about the depth of the crisis to try and persuade them to become Marxists and so on and so forth. I'm not a fatalist in that I don't think that the victory of socialism is inevitable. I, th- I see nuclear war and, and climate crisis as very big existential threats. Um, obviously, capitalism would you know, almost certainly end in such scenarios, but you wouldn't get to um, socialism as, unless the, the Pesadists are right. And the other thing you said is it can sort of generate an overconfidence that vi- the victory is assured. And again, I d- like for the same reason, I don't have that overconfidence. I have a pretty 50-50 pessimism to um, optimism ratio, I would, I would say. Right. I, I certainly wouldn't want to say that every devotee of the, the breakdown model is a fatalist. I make clear that I don't think that Grossman himself was. And just to clarify, because quietism is not a term that everybody knows, it basically means this was a charge that Grossman used against Rosa Luxemburg. Basically, there's no need for action, no need for social struggles. The, the system will just break down on its own, and we can just sit around and do nothing. And that's the quietest part. You just sit around quietly. I think it was actually too harsh on Rosa Luxemburg on that on that count because clearly she was a- an active revolutionary so I'm not sure why he said that oh because it didn't flow from her theory yeah I get it on that side of things it's just that she wasn't a quietist per se no she wasn't a quietist but her theory leads to a quietism I think was was what he was saying I think the formulation that he used was it leaves Marxism open toward a quietism some formulation like that i mean he also praises her for her reform or revolution not in the law of accumulation but in in one of the essays he wrote he praises its sort of dialectical assessment of how reform is part of revolution or how it pushes the class struggle forward and that sort of thing so he did have some praise for her as well 
Hey, we're going to return to this conversation in just a moment. But first, as we do in every episode, we're going to take just a few minutes to hear from Andrew Clard, Organizational Secretary of Marxist Humanist Initiative, the organization which sponsors this podcast. Marxist Humanist Initiative, or MHI, aims to contribute to the transformation of this capitalist world by projecting, developing, and concretizing the philosophy of Karl Marx and its further development in the Marxist humanism articulated by Raya Donayev. The ongoing COVID-19 pandemic and today's many other social, political, and economic crises make this a moment to engage people in discussion of these ideas. In the U.S., we are faced with the threat of Trumpism triumphing in all-out authoritarianism extinguishing our right to carry on these discussions. Yet at the same moment, the multiracial movement for black lives has spread to every corner of the country and the world, launching a flood of activism and new ideas that deepen the concept of freedom. MHI is dedicated to the task of proving theoretically that an alternative to capitalism is possible. We are distinguished by our economic analyses in which we do not merely assert but demonstrate that the only opposite to the current world economic system is its abolition and replacement with one not based on the production of, quote, value, close quote. Because capitalism cannot be fundamentally reformed, attempts to reform it lead to an intensification of state capitalism, not to socialism. We are not a political party, nor are we trying to lead the masses who will form their own organization and whose emancipation must be their own act. But we have seen that spontaneous actions alone are insufficient to usher in a new society. We seek a new unity of philosophy and organization in which mass movements striving for freedom lay hold of Marxist philosophy of revolution and recreate society on its basis. Our ideas and actions, as well as our structure and rules, are guided by the interests of working people and freedom movements of people of color, LGBTQ people, other minorities, women, youth, and all those around the world who are struggling for self-determination in order to freely develop their own human natures. We have no interests separate and apart from theirs. To this end, we open our website to the widest possible dialogue with people around the world We intend to practice as well as espouse a two-way road between our organization and people outside it as essential to developing a single dialectic in the relationship of theory to practice and as the way to assure the survival of Marxist humanism. Please join us. In his uh, 1929 book, uh, On Breakdown, uh, Grossman said that the operation of counter-tendencies to this basic tendency of accumulation and breakdown. He said that these counter tendencies can cause the breakdown to be postponed, but they can't eliminate the breakdown tendency. And you say the same thing in in your book, Ted. Uh, And I want to look at just one counter tendency, rising productivity. The rising productivity causes means of production to become cheaper. So as a result, the amount of value that's invested in means of production, in other words, the constant capital in value terms, it doesn't grow as rapidly as the physical means of production themselves grow. Why can't that eliminate the breakdown tendency? In other words, why can't the cheapening of means of production cause the growth of constant capital to slow down to the point that constant capital does not permanently grow faster than profit? Firstly, as I mentioned, constant capital is subsequently devalued after um, new innovation raises the rate of productivity rather than continuously. That doesn't eliminate it, though. So that will postpone it, and I can't prove on the basis that it doesn't eliminate it. The thing is, with Grossman, he actually thinks the 10 to 5 ratio in terms of constant capital to variable capital is... He thinks it's too low. He thinks it's unrealistically low, but he goes with it anyway. So he wants to make a model that is true to plausible abstraction that that corresponds to a plausible reality. So he's saying that you have to start with constant capital higher than variable capital. And I know you're saying that the the cheapening of uh, use values would, would make constant and variable capital converge, and so there isn't a breakdown. But again, there's 
there's eventually a point where the 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 amount of labor and the amount of labor time that's being exploited isn't enough to add new value to capital accumulation so that's that's the prop the ultimate problem i see and just a few marks quotes that i've picked out so he says accumulation hastens the fall of the rate of profit in as much as it implies a higher composition of capital now obviously composition of capital is both there's the value side and the technical side but that does mean that the outlay on the means of production has to rise then you get after that after the innovation has brought about an increase in use values then you get a devaluation on the value side but or at least much of the constant capital will need a breakdown for that to happen it it will as i said a recession will bring prices down and then that will make it affordable and profitable to invest what wasn't previously profitable to invest he also says the fall in the rate of profit thus expresses the falling ratio between surplus value itself and the total capital advanced and engenders the conflict between the extension of production and valorization. There's also the question of where does surplus labour come from? If there isn't a surplus of capital, there isn't a surplus of labour that um, reduces the value of labour power. And then when that surplus capital is reconverted via devaluation into profitable capital or productive capital that then reconverts some of the surplus labor into productive labor and that pushes the value of labor power back up uh, along with the outlay on variable capital especially among the most productive workers who in turn have the highest real wages and this is something you've been trying to point out that wages haven't necessarily gone down so the most productive workers will have the highest real wages and the highest necessary labour time and that will eat into surplus labour time and the massive profit available to accumulation. For me, this is why the breakdown explains what actually happens with the, with the counter tendencies. Like I say, there's, there's surplus capital and that's why there's a surplus of labour that can't be employed. It's why capitalism doesn't develop in a sort of circular simple or simple way or without a monetary incentive or profit incentive and explains why capitalists do things like they do there's not enough surplus value so they have to centralize it from below to offset that by cutting benefits or um, defeating their their competition and taking over their their capital and, and that sort of thing And I would argue that capitalism has slowed down the the technological evolution, even though we we see it it rising almost exponentially, or what feels like it's rising exponentially. Um, Technical evolution is held back by the the demands and contradictions of value creation. Capitalists often don't innovate while it is more profitable to employ human labour. And so it takes the need to valorise capital at a higher level to spur innovation often Uh, obviously competition plays a role but again that is spurred by the need to to valorize capital and competition serves as a catalyst other things we see as a result of breakdown that i would find it hard to otherwise satisfactorily answer the rise of speculation and hoarding and that sort of thing public services being privatized So, of course, the value of constant capital could and probably would crash to zero or near enough in the event of a final breakdown due to the sheer abundance and productive capacity of the technical composition. Uh, Well, that was a little bit of a long answer. So is it possible, Ted, that you could just summarize in short why the fallen value of constant capital is not a counter tendency that can forestall this breakdown? Okay, so so constant capital tool is devalued by the rising productivity, and that means that the shortage of surplus value is no longer there. But the cycle repeats itself. There's not enough labour or labour time to exploit in in order to grow that constant capital again. At some point, it can't it can't, it stops growing because there's not enough labour and and labour time to exploit. It hits a limit. It doesn't cover. Okay. 
it doesn't cover the the costs of additional capital additional variable capital and the consumption fund for the capitalists you're saying the counter tendency has a limit constant capitals yeah because the the counter tendencies the the, the devaluation of constant capital slows down i would say the devaluation speeds up Um, and and that's something your work has shown andrew the the moral depreciation has accelerated in the in the computer age hasn't it yes the well so sir certainly that's the case part of the problem brendan is that grossman counted normal reductions in prices as a counter tendency not just the devaluation of the you know old fixed capital but like the fact that the the new widgets coming off the line are cheaper than last year's widgets he said that that was a counter tendency so it's not just devaluation moral depreciation the wiping out of the values of already existing things but just the the ongoing moment by moment tendency for things to become cheaper it's not just a crisis mechanism i mean if you look at for instance it production uh you look at the data year after year after year the stuff is getting cheaper it doesn't look like it to us but we're getting so much more you know when we buy a device than than the old device so per unit of what you're actually getting what it can do year after year after year for i don't know 70 years now this stuff just keeps getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper the the cheapening of, of of the means of production although it gets covered over by inflation for most things this is just a, a, an ongoing tendency and then in addition you've got the wiping out of past values the moral depreciation stuff that you invested in and it was worth 100 is now because of rising productivity now only worth 20 so you can't recover your 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 investment on it so there's both things that go, that go on but i i don't think the whole problem can be chalked up to okay so you've got a crisis and then the, the whole thing begins again uh it's just the the issue is on an ongoing basis rising productivity tends to make commodities cheaper that tends to reduce the growth of constant capital it does reduce the growth of constant capital relative to the growth of means of production and the the issue is can it ultimately reduce the growth of constant capital to the point that it's not greater than the growth of new value profit uh, and and so forth and if it does reduce the rising productivity does reduce the growth of constant capital to that extent you're not going to have a tendency uh, toward breakdown It, it, it also reduces the amount of labor time that is contained in each commodity the rising productivity reduces the amount yes of course yes yes, yes absolutely so, that, so it works both ways so absolutely that's the problem you the more productive the capacity of the technological labor process that obviously creates more and more mass of of surplus value but it also reduces the amount of labor time that's being uh, exploited per commodity so that that's where grossman finds a breakdown because it works it works it ends up working in the opposite direction let's look at this you, let's say the amount of labor being exploited grows at five percent per year now let's assume that along with the bauer grossman model that the share of the new value that the workers get is constant so the share that the workers get their wages and benefits total go up by five percent per year the profit or surplus value goes up by five percent per year now if you got rising productivity what that's going to mean is that the mass of use values that get produced is growing faster than five percent per year including the mass of means of production being produced it'll grow at more than five percent per year so we've already taken into account that the the labor's only growing by five percent per year the living labor it's only growing by five percent per year the mass of use values is going uh, growing faster you can't double count that productivity gain okay so we're already taking account of it and the the, the means of production are growing faster than five percent per year the question is when the productivity rises and the mass of means of production are growing faster than five percent per year can't the cheapening of these means of production cause the constant capital ultimately to grow only at five percent per year yes but then you need to 
stop the reverse in the devaluation of constant capital because you're starting to reverse the reason you invest in profit and at the same time there's less labor time being exploited per commodity so that's why eventually that scenario breaks down that's what i'm going to argue (laughs) i can't prove it without you you know without charts and things over a podcast but yeah i mean it's very hard to do calculus verbally but we're trying it here yeah Yeah, i would say it it would work for a while but not indefinitely that's 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 what I. That's my position. Oh, pe- pe- people, people should read your paper, and they should go back and listen to the podcast that you did on on your paper. And everybody should read the unabridged edition of Grossman. Now in English, I haven't gotten through it yet. Right. I mean, I I, I don't see anything that would that would lead to a reversal or, or a breakdown in what what has just been described. Uh, especially when things kind of converge to a limit uh, and grow ultimately at the same rate, that's kind of, from an intuitive perspective, the case least likely to generate a, a breakdown. Generally, when, when things run up against limits, then you get breakdowns. But when things converge and start to grow at the same rate and level off, all of this implies that the rate of profit has, you know, if it's fallen, now it's the fall is leveled off. That's when you're least likely to say, from an intuitive perspective, this is not a proof, these words, but that's when you're least likely to think that there needs to be a breakdown or a reversal or, or, or anything like that. So I'm having, I'm having a lot of trouble with that kind of notion i'm trying to imagine what you're imagining and i'm not coming up with anything i'll 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 have to try and produce something that's that's more concrete well we'll have to leave it there because we're running out of time but thank you ted reese for being on the podcast today thanks so much thank you the book is the end of capitalism the thought of henrik grossman and we will link to that as well as link to andrew's review of the book Hey, that's all the time we have for this episode of Radio Free Humanity. If you like the podcast, please do stop by MarxistHumanistInitiative.org to listen to other episodes and to read more about these issues and others. As always, if you like the podcast, we encourage you to write to us, to comment and rate the podcast, and of course to share with all your friends and enemies.